Where are we today, Phil? Outside Wydy Court Primary School, Steve. We've come up here from Wydy Lane. We've driven up Wydy Lane and we're outside the school because back in the days of the Civil War, the school was obviously not here, but Wydy House stood here, the home of Yeoman Heel. Um, but what is more interesting than the house is to the west of the school today, the house then, was an earthwork known as Hopton's Work, a royalist fort that was predominantly used during the English Civil War and the Siege of Plymouth. Right, now I'm walking up to an area west of Wydy House, where Hopton's work was thrown up late in 1642 by the Royalists. On the old documents, it says that the Royalists threw up their fort, a fortification, west of the house in a field. Could it be this field? We're not 100% sure. It could be further out. Before they built the houses to the left there, Southwell Road, Great Berry Road, this was all open ground. So could part of the fort be here? Now this fort was significant in the Civil War, although it was way out of Plymouth and it belonged to the Royalists. When the Royalists came to Plymouth in 1642, they camped at Plimpton. But to stop Plymouth getting supplies from north of the town and towards the Tavistock area, what they did they threw up a number of little fortifications, the Royalists. There was one here, there was one at Stoke, there was a place at Vengrove, near Vengrove. Um, there were other ones, many. Knackers Knoll, Crown Hill, there was another one. Robra Down, there was another one. Um, small outposts. But this one here was used throughout the Civil War. And there was a lot of fighting between the two sides during the English Civil War between Hopton's work to the south of the fort and to the west. A lot of raids came on when the Royalist main armies came to Plymouth three times in late 1643, mid 1644 and early 1645, the Royalists enclosed Plymouth from the north of the town with big armies. When they pulled away, Plymouth was blockaded from Plimpton and with Cornwall being under the Royalist control, Plymouth could only really forage to the north of the city or by getting supplies in from the Navy. Um, this Hopton's work was nearly always occupied by quite a substantial body of Royalists, cavalry and infantry. There's no, mentions of no mention of artillery here um, because they were too far out. It was too far from Plymouth for the use of guns. So all through the Civil War, the records I have come from 1644 really. It's not much mentioned before. In November 1642, Hopton's work stood here as a garrison, small garrison. And when Hopton abandoned his siege of Plymouth or his blockade of Plymouth, they evacuated this fort. And in late 1642, the Roundheads came out and raised it down to the ground, pulled down the walls, the earth walls. After that, when the Royalists came back to Plymouth, predominantly in 1643 under Prince Morris, they reoccupied this place. <clears throat> Prince Morris stayed at Whitey House to the right, to the near, nearby, um, as a guest of Yeoman Heel, who owned the property then. Later on, in 1644, before the king came with his army, there was major skirmishing here. There was a battle just to the south where Colonel Digby, who was in command of the Royalist forces in June 1644, had a rapier cut across his face by a man called Cornet Bristol, and where a Captain John Arundel a Colonel John Arundel, was badly wounded and captured by a man called Captain William Braddon from the Plymouth Garrison in the same skirmish. It was quite a significant battle. Um, he was taken back to Plymouth, uh, Maudlin Fort, and died of his wounds. Um, this kind of skirmishing went to, this was quite an active place. Every month there was skirmishing here. At one stage, the part of the Plymouth Garrison under Colonel Robert Martin, Captain Robert Martin, well, Colonel Robert Martin, sorry, took his cavalry out to shore, bypassed Hopton's work, went all the way over to Plimpton, captured a number of horses, took the short back, shortcut back to cross Longbridge, came by Hopton's work and was attacked by a body of Royalist cavalry who pursued him from Plimpton, 
Fortunately, there was a band of musketeers from the town set out and they were hiding somewhere south of this place, to the south by what is now the A38. And when the Royalist cavalry came up, they opened fire on them. Um, the panic, the rounding cavalry panicked and fled and the musketeers managed to pull back safely. So that was another skirmish, but this went on all through the Civil War, back and forth this area. At, after the King came here in September 1644, he was a guest of Yeoman Hill at Wydy House nearby. And apparently every morning he would, after breakfast, he would march, he would ride up to his siege lines around the Manamede area. Every day he did that before he broke the siege and, fled, and left Plymouth. Um, but the king's bed, apparently the story goes that Yeoman Hill never used the bedroom the king stayed in. He kept it as a shrine because he was an ardent royalist, this man. And the king's bed was there for many years and everything he used was not touched. At the end of the Civil War, towards the end of the Civil War, when things went wrong for the, for the roundheads, or the royalists, oh, blimey, he, <laughs> Hopton's work was besieged late in the war in January 1646, one of the final fight, fights that took place here. The Plymouth garrison marched out, confident now that the, to Sir Thomas Fairfax was coming with a new model army. Um, so they boldly marched out to besiege Hopton's works, realising that the, Roy the Royalist forces were really ready to finish, ready to give up. Colonel John Digby was still in command. He'd recovered from his facial wound. The, the siege went on for a day and a night, but the next morning, Digby managed to scrape together a force of cavalry and come to relief, came to relieve the fort, Hopton's work, and the, with the Roundheads withdrew back to Plymouth. A week later, January the 12th, the Royalists broke their siege of Plymouth and marched away. They abandoned Hopton's work, um, all their old muskets, broken muskets, anything they had too much to carry, ammunition, was dumped down a well that I believe is now somewhere in Southwell Street. Is it still all in there, it's, Phil? Yeah, You've it's, got to wonder, yes, haven't yeah. you? <laughs> but this, I'm sure this area here, or just to the west of where the houses are, was where Hopton's work once stood during the English Civil War. And in fact, in, 19, in the 1930s, the field here was still known as Hopton's work. A piece here from Steve, standing outside the fence of the school field, my rather active imagination cannot help but think if I can see the west and east flanks of this earthwork still somehow visible in the field. Admittedly, it could have been done to landscape the, 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 the playing field, but also possibly it may not. This could be actual tangible, visible remains of Hopton's work. The elevation here in centre left could possibly be the remains of the west flank. We mustn't forget as time's gone by, these would be washed away by rain. When we're talking about a civil war fortification, for the most part, we're talking about earth not stone, and rain washes earth away. And here we have, on the other side, we have the eastern flank, possibly, of Hopton's work. Admittedly, it could have been done just to make the play area on the right, but it, to me, it's more or less the right size of what we might expect. And imagination brings history alive. And for me, this is alive. We're now going to go and have a look at some place names in this area that still exist and were named after some of the characters that actually were here or fought in the English Civil War. Right, when the war ended, Whitey House 
uh, was rebuilt several times after the war. Um, and in the 1940s, during the Second World War, it was bombed by the German Air Force. Uh, but it was still kept by a family. Um, but in 1953, unfortunately, Plymouth City Council destroyed what was left of the house and everything in it. All the history was gone and they built Whitey, this estate here, Whitey Estate not concerned, as they have done many times with the many other Plymouth old buildings, old famous houses where our history was born. Nothing remains of Whitey House. So Phil, Hopton's work and now Hopton Close, which we can see is a uh, 1960s possibly, 1970s housing estate. Uh, what's the story here, Phil? Well, obviously named after Sir Rolf Hopton, who was the commander who first came to Plymouth in 1642 and, and blockaded Plymouth from the Plimpton side of the Plym and threw up, his men threw up an earthwork and they obviously named it after their commanding officer, Sir Rolf Hopton. Now, I'll tell you a bit about Sir Rolf Hopton, just a sort of a short biography. He was born in the late 1590s, uh, Somersetshire, from Somerset, Somersetshire man. Um, he, he fought in the religious wars in Europe in the 1620s and 30s. At the start of the English Civil War, he sided with the king. Um, after a dispute, with his superior, the Marquis of Hartford, a very inept commander who abandoned the army on the North Devon coast when the Royal, when the Roundheads were sort of taking over Somerset. Um, Hopton didn't join him as he went across the river, the water, the channel, the Bristol Channel to Wales. He rode into Cornwall, raised a Cornish army, trained this Cornish army, formed it into regiments, had some great commanders and had, uh, for the next six months, he had a, a quite a successful um, time with three major battles, Braddock Down, Braddock Church, although the fighting was not there, Stratton, the Battle of Stratton in May 1643, and Polson Bridge near Launceston. Successful royalist victories over the Devonshire Roundheads, really. Um, but he, fought, he also fought at Mobbury, his men fought at Mobbury and were defeated. He's failed in his siege of Plymouth, um, he joined the Marquis of Hartford again and Prince Morris at Chard in June 1643. Went to Lansdowne, fought Sir William Waller's Royal Head Army there up to a standstill. After the battle there, an uh, ammunition wagon blew up and he was so badly injured, he was out of action for months and months. Um, he was taken to, to recover to devises for a while. After that, he was given command of a small force in and around Winchester. Later in the war, when the war was going badly again for the Royalists, he came back to the West Country and he fought one of the last battles here up in North Devon at Torrington, the Battle of Torrington in 1646. Um, was defeated, his army scattered and he withdrew into Cornwall and in March 1646 negotiated terms for a ceasefire with the Sir Thomas Fairfax's army and then he fled abroad to France. That's what happened to to Rolf Hopton. So now we're at Ruthven Close. Is there a civil war link here as well? Yes, Colonel William Ruthven was a Scottish mercenary soldier who came into Plymouth by accident late in 1642 with a group of 200 soldiers that were en route to Ireland. Um, but they were blown in here by storms. The city council and the town leaders asked, asked Rutherford to take command of their troops because they weren't really organized in, uh, at that time. There was no leader really. So Colonel William Rutherford took command. He helped organize the defenses in the early days, started with the earthworks, the major earthworks and the inner line. And significantly in December, 1642, 
While the Royalists were besieging, not besieging, blockading Plymouth from the west, east side of the Plym, he led a cavalry force from Plymouth, 300 men, bypassing Hopton's work, which was up there to my right. It's just up there, isn't it, yeah, Phil? Bypassing the Royalists there, he went all the way over the moors and came through Ivy Bridge. And on the morning of December the 7th, early in the morning, he appeared above Mobbury. The Royalist militia that were gathered there with some Royalist leaders from Hopton's army to organise them were surprised when the cavalry charged down the hill. They dispersed. There was fighting around Champernau Mansion in the church, um, but most of the Royalist uh, so militia had dis vanished in the morning mist. Uh, so Ruthven brought back a significant number of prisoners. Now he was a great commander at the time. But he failed dismally a few months, a few weeks later at the Battle of Braddock Down, where he did not wait for the Earl of Stamford to come with a significant army before marching into Cornwall to take on Hopton. He was so, he became so big enough after his initial success that he marched in thinking they would surrender. But Hopton attacked him, counterattacked him at near Braddock Church, Tap House, West Tap House, near Lisgard, and defeated the Roundhead army capturing baggage, ammunition, horses, and many prisoners. The survivors fled back to Plymouth via Saltash um, and ferries over there. But there's a, a lot of com confusion in some of the early books on the English Civil War in the Southwest. People call William Ruthven, Lord Ruthven, who was a Scottish Lord, um, who was with King Charles during the later part of the Civil War. But they mix his name up with Colonel William Ruthven, but the man who's named here is Colonel William Ruthven. And it's strange, it's very significant that he's very close to Hopton's close. Ruthven close, Hopton's close. After the war, Ruthven left Plymouth, some say under a cloud, because his wife didn't pay her bills before she left. And they moved to Exeter, and then he disappears from history. I've not been able to find out what happened to him in the end. Just making sure I don't get hit here, trying to cross the road. Hard to imagine, this was once a little lane. It's now a pretty hectic road. I think we're okay now, here we go. Phil, we're just across the road from Hopkins, Hopton's, and I see there's another name here, Trevanian Close. Yes. Is this yet one other link? Yes, this, John Trevanian was a colonel who commanded one of Hopton's Cornish regiments that were begun early in the Civil War. Remember I said he had four regiments of Furt and about 500 cavalry and he arranged this group all together and a lot of the officers who served under him, the four men, after Hopton was wounded at um, near Devizes at Lansdowne by the ammunition cart exploding, a lot of the officers of his, of his Cornish regiments and a lot of the soldiers were killed um, shortly before and after. Grenville died and a lot of others died uh, at the siege of Bristol where the Cornish infantry were decimated by the roundhead defenders of Bristol. It's a very sad ending to a good army. The survivors eventually made their way back to Cornwall under what leaders they had, but that campaign under Prince Morris and Hartford around Lansdowne and Bristol saw the end of the Cornish infantry, one of the best organised royalist forces during the English Civil War. And we mustn't forget, just up the hill, is Hopton's work again. Hopton's work. So these names are right on the spot, aren't yeah, they? Yeah, they're associated with what, the civil war in this area. Right, Steve, we've come down Widey Lane, the old historic lane, past Hopton's Close. Down below us is Wardlaw Gardens. Now, I've stopped here because if you were here in 1640s, you'd see not all these trees were here then because they used them all for firewood. No houses. You could look down the valley and see a similar scene over there. No houses, very few trees. But you can see from here why Hopton's work is an important point. On the high ground above us, you could look over and see roundhead outposts. 
that, and cavalry patrols that would guard this area during the period of blockade when the Royalist main armies were not here but the main Royalist force would be on the east side of the plim. So you'd have these two forces smouldering at each other if you like but you can see why there was a lot of significant action here in the Civil War because you're between the lines. Plymouth soldiers would ride out, mainly horse, go out on foraging expeditions to capture horses from the enemy, prisoners for information and bring in supplies. And this happened all through the Civil War. If you look at the records, the dates, there was a lot of skirmishing and cavalry encounters between that point over there on the high ground, which is towards Manamede and Hopton's work. And I talked to a few people when I did lectures over in that, who live in that area now. And a lot of them have found cannonballs and musket balls in their gardens dating from the Civil War. So this area is quiet now, but in the days of the Civil War, it was a, a, routine, it was a, a weekly or a, month, or a daily sometimes battleground, if you like, between the, the Royalists and the Roundheads. Let's go across the road, Phil. I think there's something over there. Oh, yes. Right, Steve, Wardlow Gardens, Wardlow Close. Could that, be, could that mean Wardlow, who was a colonel and governor of Plymouth for a while during the English Civil War, a Scottish soldier known as Colonel James Wardlow? But the spelling's wrong. Well, it ought I, to be W-A-R-D-L-A-W. I can't think of any other reason it's here with this name because I'm not sure if I know anyone called Wardlow, but Colonel James Wardlow was a, a leading uh, character in Plymouth during the later Civil War in the 1643, after Hopton had left Plymouth. He came towards the period of the Battle of Freedom Fields, as people call it these days, um, the Stat Sabbath Day fight. He was governor of Plymouth at the time, but he was not involved in the actual fighting at Freedom Fields. But the monument at Freedom Park has got Colonel James Ward Law on it. But being close to Hopton's, close to Vanians and Ruthven, I'm sure this is meant to be another English Civil War connection. And let's not forget, Phil, those other streets are just literally a stone's throw from yeah, here, aren't just they? Just up the road. And you've got Ward Law close, whether it's a spelling mistake or like Plymouth Council, the Blackfriars came here. They've put this up by mistake, I don't know, but as I'm if sure they people can make fail. up their own mind. As, <laughs> as if, if that would ever be the case. Yes, they never make mistakes. But um, he was a significant character in the Civil War, although he was sort of out of the period of Hopton and Wardlaw, um, Ruthven and Trevanian. He was, there was a man called Wardlaw in Plymouth during the English Civil War. Right, Steve, we're just on this side of Whitey Cottage here. This is an old map that puts it all into perspective from this side. This is Whitey Cottage. We're just going to go back across the road, the main road, which was Whitey Lane, towards the school area where Whitey Court once stood, or as it was called in the Civil War, Whitey. So if we look back at, backwards, Phil, yes. we can see Whitey Cottage, which is on a later map. This was not here in the Civil War period. But it's on the lane, isn't it? So we it know where we are. It is on the other side of the are. lane. But if it was on the lane in the Civil War, it'd be quite more over this way, following the lane. But it places us exactly where yes, we are. The lane turns here and this road seems to go up. Especially when we compare it to the map, yes. because we now know we are exactly there and we know 
that the school is here because we can see where the school is yes. and that tells us that Whitey Court House is just Whitey there. House. In this area, yeah. In that area yeah. and Hopton's work is would the therefore here. be left. So, so that gives us a very good probability that in what we believe about the location of Hopton's work is pretty correct. Pretty correct. And I wish they'd do a survey, an archaeological survey on that field, because I'm sure we will find something in that area. Let's have a final look at Wydy Lane to give us an idea of where we are in today's modern landscape. Here is the lane today. Wydy Cottage down the hill and as the hill increases at the bottom we would have Wydy School leading to Wydy House with Hopton's work in front of it as the hill goes up on the rise of the road just there. But perhaps the better way to understand this in the modern topography is to take to the air. Right Steve, this is an aerial view of what we believe is Hopton's work. Hopton's, the field west of Wydy Court School to the right. Wydy Court School, Hopton's field, well Hopton's work. It's the field west of the school and it was still called Hopton's work in the 1930s. So all evidence points to it being Hopton's work. Now, if you carry on looking, the view from here is quite amazing in the old days, before any of these trees were here, because they were all chopped down to make the fortifications and used for firewood. But if you see, if you look south towards Plymouth, the A38 there, Hopton's work is below us. This is the amazing view of Plymouth from the air, but you could only see up to higher Compton from Hopton's work, which is all this area here. And that was high ground. That was like a ridge of high ground. And this is where the two sides could see each other during the days of the Civil War. But this is an amazing view of Plymouth. You can see there the sound. But none of this was here in those days. The town was down below. You could just about probably make out St Andrew's Church Spire. And that's about all you could see from this area. Nothing else. <laughs>